Good morning, everyone from the State Library. Um, this is uh, Sarah Childs, and uh, we are about ready to get started. We're, it looks like we're having a, some sound issues uh, on the Plainfield end, where we have Matthew Stevenson ho hopefully joining us. Um, we're going to see if we can get that straightened out, then we're probably going to get started in a few minutes. Stevenson from the Plainfield Guilford Township Public Library. Uh, this meeting is about the, uh, the overdrive records being added to Evergreen Indiana Catalog, and I'm joined by uh, Sarah Childs, who is the Cataloging Committee Chair, and I'm also on the Cataloging Committee as well as on the E-Resources Committee. So you probably have heard the news. If not, uh, good news is the overdrive records are finally coming to Evergreen, something we've been working on for a long time, and uh, I think the solution that we have found is going to be good. It's not perfect, but it will, I think, solve most of the um, concerns that people had had earlier. So as it stands right now, there's about 30,000 records uh, that are going to be imported into the catalog record. And you might realize that's a lot of records. And as a cataloging staff, uh, you probably are thinking, I don't have time to deal with 30,000 more records. But uh, even though it is a lot, I can assure you that you as cataloging staff and anybody else on your staff working with the catalog uh, and the MARC records, there's going to be almost nothing to do. And so that's going to be very nice. You don't have to catalog the items. As, as your library purchases e-content um, material, you do not have to catalog them. All of that is going to be handled directly by the state library. They will be backloading all of the MARC records in, in batches, probably on a, a weekly basis but they'll, they'll work out the details. It could be monthly. So you don't have to worry about importing any mark, uh, mark records. Um, we want to talk for a moment also about what exactly records will be imported. Um, there's about 35,000 items that are in the E-Indiana Digital Consortium. Not all of those records will go in. Only the items that are um, owned directly by the consortium that is, the, the one user, one copy records will be imported. So anything that is uh, metered access, whether it's metered for time, like 20, 12 months, 24 months, or if it's metered for uh, a certain amount of checkouts, 24 checkouts, I think is usually what it is, uh, those items will not be added. So again, this isn't a, a perfect solution. There's a lot of popular stuff that is, unfortunately, metered access. Um, but most of the stuff, it's about 30,000 records. Um, is owned by the consortium, and it will be imported in those records you'll be able to see. So um, as I mentioned, the reason why we can't import them all, um, we, we want to give the most access we can to our patrons. The metered access material, though, is very difficult to manage with uh, such a large consortium. There's no policies about who has to purchase it, um, who has to make it, if libraries have to purchase it once and then always make it available and keeping up with metered access material as it comes in and out of the catalog um, would just be overwhelming. So the easiest way to do this was just to import items that we own. And, and for now, anyway, the, the metered access stuff is going to have to stay out. And again, if, if you uh, do any of the purchasing at your library, you've seen the reports that come in about the metered access stuff. And uh, you know how, how complicated that can get. Um, we receive multiple reports each month of items that are expiring or going to expire. And so the decision was made just to do the, the stuff that we own. So uh, about once a week, the State Library will batch load these MARC records from OverDrive into the consortium. And as you may also know, there are uh, another complicating factor is that uh, within the Evergreen consortium, there are three digital consortia. And um, so part of the one reason why it's taken us a while to figure this out is we didn't know how to make that work with everybody, with people in different systems. Um, the solution is those records will be imported, and they will have uh, three links, A56 fields, and you will be able to select your digital consortia from there. So uh, it's important to know what consortium you're part of. Uh, these records, the ebook records, will uh, they look pretty much like a regular record, but they will not have holdings. Uh, so you're not going to be able to see whether or not an item is available in the Evergreen catalog. 
and you also not be able to see um, if they check something out from OverDrive that's not going to appear in their Evergreen account. If they check their checked out items, it won't show up there. So these records, uh, again, they don't have holdings, so they don't interact with their account the same way that a physical item does. They'll just be for display purposes, essentially, in the catalog. So they, uh, when patrons see these records, they're going to need to click on a link that will kick them out to OverDrive, and that from there they can um, view the item or decide if they want to check it out or not. Um, and so this will not also will not affect the way that they manage their OverDrive accounts now if they're already doing that. So I think we're going to do a quick demo. So if I'm a patron and I'm searching for a um, particular book, I can do a search here. I wonder what librarians searched for in demos before Harry Potter. Um, so it, we, for this record, the Harry Potter cookbook, you can see the first record there. Number one is the physical book. Number three, though, is the ebook, and you see the ebook symbol there, and you also see that it's a record that has no holdings attached to it, which is as it should be. And if we choose that one, if we were wanting the ebook, this is pretty much what the records are going to look like. They um, have the ebook symbol, and then the three links. You can see there for the three different uh, consortia. So depending on what library you were. Uh, or what consortium your library is in, you'll choose. Here at Plainfield, we're in the E-Indiana Digital Consortium. So if I click on the first link there, it will automatically bring it up in OverDrive, give me the option of borrowing it or adding it to the wishlist or whatever, whatever you want to do in OverDrive from there. And then I'll go back, uh, let's go back there. Again, if I was at another library that was part of a different consortium, I could bring it up here, and in this case, because I'm Plainfield's not part of this one, it's going to tell me to sign in, uh, which I can't do. So items that um, that are owned by the E-Indiana Digital Consortium, but that maybe aren't owned by the other consortia, um, when, they, when they click on the link, it will take them to the, uh, the page to, where they can request that item for the library to purchase. This first part here was not that much different than what the patron services uh, roundtable introduced, but we do want to lay the groundwork for uh, to, for how the state library is going to be importing these and why certain records were chosen and um, sort of how, how your patrons are going to interact with that. And now Sarah is going to talk about the, um, in the second part, talk about what you as a cataloger uh, need to know when looking at these records and uh, dealing with them in the catalog now. Okay, so um, how is this going to affect the catalogers? Well, as you might be able to guess, since we, since Matthew mentioned that there are 30, some 30,000 records that are going to be initially loaded, uh, there's going to be a lot more records for ebooks and e audiobooks in the catalog. And it's really important that everyone know how to recognize these records for the OverTribe materials. So you might be wondering, why is it so important if I don't have to load them? It, I can just ignore them, right? I'm, I, it doesn't matter. Uh, or you might also be thinking, how am I going to recognize these MARC records? <laughs> they, won't they look pretty much like all the rest of the MARC records? And um, it is important that you recognize them because you're not going to be able to add holdings to them. So if you, if you look at one and you think it's for a physical item and try to add holdings, it's going to stop you. Uh, which would be frustrating if you can't figure out why. And also, it's really important that you avoid merging them with other records. So we're going to talk about what these records are going to look like so that every time you see one, you'll be like, oh, yep, that's an OverDrive record. Totally obvious. Know, what, know that I'm not supposed to touch that or merge it with anything, add holdings. Those are off limits, essentially. OK. so. Um, be because the OverDrive materials are accessed through OverDrive and not checked out, they don't have holdings and they have the links in them. So when you try to add holdings, you're going to get this er error message. It says, um, records from OverDrive um, transcend <laughs> without holdings I cannot have copies. So that tells you 
this is one of these overdrive records we talked about. You cannot add holdings, and so you need to go back to the catalog and look again. You've tried to add your holdings to the wrong record, and you need to find a different record or import a record. That's great. It's good that you know, you're know you not going to be able to accidentally add the holdings to the existing overdrive records, but it is possible to end up with holdings on records if you merge them together. So that's the thing that you really have to be aware of and be careful not to do. You do not want to merge the overdrive records with other records. So how do you avoid this? Well, the main thing is to be able to recognize the overdrive records and be sure very careful to exclude those when you're merging. And they're really not that difficult to recognize as long as you know what to look for. So when you see these rec records and you're doing merging, don't mer stop. Don't merge. Uh, do not uh, pass go. <laughs> do not collect $200. Back out and or make sure you uh, Mark those mer those uh, overdrive records as um, ones to exclude from your merging process. So how how do we recognize them? Well, as we saw, you um, they're very easy to recognize from the um, search screen because they have the ebook or e audio um, icons. So. From there, it's very easy. But when you're merging, you're not going to see those uh, handy little icons. You're going to be seeing the mark record. So you need to be able to recognize those from the mark record side. So we're going to talk about that. And there are a lot of things that you can watch for to help you recognize them. And here's a long list of things. Um, and we're going to go through and take a look at these records a little more carefully so that you can see these things in the record and know, uh, know what those are. So um, the first thing is that they're going to have eight, the 856 fields with the links to OverDrive. That's the easiest and most obvious thing that you're going to find in every single one of these OverDrive records. You, there's going to be an O or an S in the form field and the fixed fields. They're going to have extra um, 006 and or 007 fields in the records. Um, the AACR2 records are going to have a subfield H in the 245 that says electronic resource. And the um, RDA records, 338, that says online resource. And then you'll find that in some of the records, it doesn't have a 300 field at all, or else it might say online resource. There will be fields that will explain how to access it, like a 533 or a 538. There will probably be a 655 that says electronic books. And there will be tons of fields that will just mention overdrive, electronic, or online throughout the record. And any of those things is a red flag. Now, any given record may not have all of these examples. Um, but if you see any one of these, you know to pause and look at the record more carefully and that this is a sign that this very well could be an overdrive record. So it does not have to have all of these things to be an overdrive record. It might have only, say, half of these things. Um, but that's still a sign that, okay, this is probably an overdrive record and I should absolutely not merge it and I'm not going to be able to add holdings to it. Okay, so like I said, the very, the very first thing and most obvious thing that you're going to see in each and every one of these overdrive records is it's going to have these 856 fields and um, so it's got the it's got the links to each of the uh, digital consortiums and so the the subfield U has the URL and then it's got this subfield Y and that tells you each consortium name and that's the part that displays in the catalog so if you see these then you know immediately oh this is an overdrive record so Really, we could probably stop here and you'd know anytime you see this, it's an overdrive record because this is the one thing that's going to be in every single one of these. But uh, we're going to go delve a little further and talk about some of the many other aspects of the records that indicate that it's an overdrive record. Okay, so um, we mentioned an O or an S in the form field. So the form field is one of the fixed fields. And so here, this one has an S. Um, and so that tells us that it is a uh, 
it's for a digital material. And it, if the record has an O or an S in the form field, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an overdrive record. It could mean that it's some kind of electronic, as some other kind of electronic or digitally accessed record, so like the Inspire records. But anytime you see this, that's a sign that it's probably not a physical item. Um, and so you, or that it's a different format than typical, so it's going to give you pause about, oh, okay, there's something out of the ordinary about this record and I want to take a look, closer look at it. Another thing is that uh, the audiobook records, so there's the digital audio, you can see this one's an audiobook, it's got the type I, and we've still got that S up there at the top, and then it's got an 006. Um, which is indicating that it's not a, the physical audiobook record. Um, it's got electronic aspects to it. So it's got the 006, and then it's got an extra 007. You can see here um, there's an 007 with CR that indicates it's uh, a computer. And if you're used to looking at the 007s, which we should all be getting more used to those now that it, they're so important, um, uh, that you see this has SZ, whereas when you have an audiobook record that's on um, CDs, it's going to say SD. So that SZ is also an indication that, oh, wait, there's something unusual about this. The Z means that it's not a sound disk. It's this audio information is accessed in a different way. So uh, the 06 and 007 fields are going to be different in uh, audiobook records for e-audio than they are for physical audio. So watch for that. You'll see that in um, book records, here we are in a book record, you can see the type is A, um, they're also going to have an 006 or 007 to indicate the digital online aspects of this uh, resource. So um, your typical book record doesn't have an 006 and it very rarely has an 007. So if you see those, that's going to be a sign. Okay, and then we're also going to have in any AACR2 records, and we, it's going to be a mix. So you're going to have plenty of AACR2 records as well as some RDA records, and we'll probably see more and more RDA records for these as time goes on. But um, so if it's an AACR2 record, it's going to have a 245H that's going to say electronic resource. So that's a pretty big sign right there. And if it is a um, RDA record, it's going to have a 338 that says online resource. Um, so that's what you'll see for the RDA record instead of that 245H. You might find that in a lot of these AACR2 records, it doesn't have a 300 field at all. Um, these records that we're loading from Overdrive for the Overdrive records are free. And sometimes with free, you get what you're paid for, and they're not maybe the highest quality of records. So they, um, they're, the records do the job. They've got titles. They've got subject, they've got subject um, access. They're going to help our patrons find access, but they're maybe not um, as perfect as catalogers might wish to see them. And so these uh, off a lot of these AACR2 records, it looks like, do not have 300 fields. And so that's a little sign for you. Um, if it's missing a 300 field with your pagination and your size of your book, then that might just be an uh, overdrive record. So you can see we jump from 260 to 490 here with no 300 field in between. Um, but then, on the other hand, it might have a 300 field, um, and the RDA records, it looked like, generally did. Um, and some of the ACR2 records might as well. It's, um, that's one of the things about the free records, is they're not always completely consistent. But so, um, the 300 field, you can see this one says it's an online resource, um, instead of saying it's a, it's a book that is, um, you know, 12 pages as a board book might. And that's another thing about um, the records not being maybe as perfect as we might like. You can see it's got a 250 here for that says first board book edition. Well, that's a little misleading because obviously if it's an online book, it's not on board pages. <laughs> um, this is a, a digital version of the board book. Um, so the 
the addition statement might be a little confusing. One of the things that you'll find in most of these records is um, some kind of indication that uh, the resource is accessed online and it tells you how to do that. So you might see a 533 and you can see it says electronic reproduction and then in the subfield N it tells you how you access this item. So it tells us that it requires um, Overdrive Read or Adobe, Adobe Digital Edition, so this is, or Amazon Kindle. This is the software that you need to be able to uh, access the digital file. Okay, so this is the 538, um, which is an, you might see a 533, you might see a 538, you might even see a 500 field that tells you um, what you need to access this. And again, it, it's telling us the same information that we saw in that 533 um, in terms of access that the software that it's required. Um, and with an e-audiobook, it's going to be slightly different um, software than with the uh, e-books. And you can also see most of these records have a 655 for electronic books. And that seemed to be the case whether it was an e-audio or a, um, a, um, an e-book. So um, be aware of that. If you do a search for electronic books, it, you're going to end up with results for e-audio books as well as for e-books. The good news about recognizing these overdrive records is once you know what to look for, you'll see there are signs of it all throughout the record. There are all sorts of indications that this is a, a record for an e-book and not a print book. So um, you can see I've highlighted all of these things that tell us, oh, wait a second, this, this book is a, this is a record for an e-book. Most of these record items do have unique ISBNs, and so they'll often say in the O20 that it's for an electronic book. Um, we'll see uh, most of these records also have an O37, which tells where this, um, where you can essentially order these materials and it's overdrive. So we've got in this uh, 037 it tells us overdrive and it's got the overdrive website. This one's an AACR2 record so we've got that electronic resource in the 245. We have a 500 that tells us that the title came from the ebook information screen. So that's kind of a little hint. Oh wait, this is probably an ebook. And then again, we have that 538 that tells us it can't it, the software you need. So we've got um, Overdrive Read is the first one that's mentioned. The 650s have subfield twos that tell us that the, this subject information was provided by Overdrive. And we have, like we mentioned, most of these have a 655 for electronic books. And then we have these 856s, which is the first thing we talked about that has. Um, the links to overdrive.com where people can access the materials. So there's all this information throughout the record. So here is another overdrive record and it's slightly different. It has slightly different um, signs in the book, but ma many of them are the same. A few of them are different, but once you know what to look for, you can see it's all over the record. It's really clear that this is for an ebook. So again, we have a um, electronic book listed in the O20. We've got OverDrive in the O37. We've got the 245 for electronic resource. We have this 533. It tells us OverDrive in the 650s, electronic books. As you can see, all throughout the record, it's really obvious as long as you know the signs it's that if you see any one of these, you know to pause and go, OK, this is an OverDrive record. Here's one that's, here's the whole RDA record, and you can see um, this one doesn't have quite as many uh, signs that jump out at you because, um, uh, so there's more, more than you see. It doesn't have the overdrive in the 650s, um, but we've still got electronic book up here in the 20s, the 37. We've got um, online resource in the 300. We've got 338 that says online resource, and you can see that, um, the 337 also says computer, that you need um, some sort of uh, computer or digital tool in order to access these. 
Um, this particular record doesn't have a 533 or a 538 that tells you how to um, access it. You see this 588 says print version record, and so that might be a little confusing, but the 588 is basically telling you they got, this, they got a lot of this information to create this record from the record for the print version. Um, and then again, we see it's got a 655 for electronic books, and we've got uh, these um, links for the, for, to access the materials in the 856s. And, um, and then it, this 7 and 76 down here is a um, field that tells you information about r a related resource. So in this case, there's um, the print version of this book. It's the same, it, the same pictures, the same text, just on board pages as opposed to a digital file. So this is a related resource. So if you see print version, first board book edition down here at the bottom in the 776, that does not apply to this record. It's telling us that this is something that is related to this ebook version. And so it doesn't mean, oh, you can add your holdings to a print version to this record. It means, hey, if you're interested in a print version, then uh, that is available elsewhere. And so um, this particular uh, record is one um, that is an older OverDrive record. These are records that were loaded um, for a library that's in a different consortium than EIDC, uh, and they have been loading their OverDrive records all along. And so those have been in the system. Any, case, any cases where they're... Um, where we both have holdings, most of those are going to be merged, but you may come upon these where it's one that they have that maybe we don't have in, EI, in the Indiana, e Indiana Digital Consortium, or for whatever reason, the records just didn't merge because as we all know, sometimes um, items may be a match, but the system doesn't recognize that. Um, so you'll see um, a few of these records as well. Um, so instead of having the three 856s, this has um, a couple of different ones. This is still an overdrive record. Same rules apply. Don't add, you can't add holdings, and you don't want to merge this record. Um, and even if you find that it looks like um, there's a uh, that it's a match to one of the other OverDrive records, you might not want to merge that, but maybe call it to the attention of Anna or me and we'll, or Jocelyn, and we'll take a look at it and determine, or um, also, uh, and we'll take a look at it and consult with the library who has this before we merge these, just to make sure that they are a match. Um, so if you notice those, you could give us a heads up. But I would say, let's just make it a rule that we don't merge overdrive records just uh, to be on the safe side. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier not to have exceptions. OK, and so this one is an example of an, of an e-audio book. Um, you can see, again, it's got that uh, 530. It's got the 037 at the top with the overdrive uh, information. Um, in this case, in the 020, it doesn't say electronic book, it says sound recording, so uh, you're not going to see electronic book every time. As I mentioned, these records aren't completely consistent, you're going to see variations, but usually if you look for signs, it's going to be pretty clear that this is uh, an overdrive rec record, even if they're uh, slightly different from record to record. So again, we have this 245 that says electronic resource um, instead of sound recording. Um, and we've got a 538 here that tells us the software that's required. It says OverDrive Listen or OverDrive App um, is needed to listen to the audiobook. Um, we do have those subfield twos for OverDrive. We've got electronic books. And we've got those um, 856s that have the OverDrive links. And you can see it also has an 856 here that's an excerpt um, where people can take a look at uh, the at samples and I don't remember I didn't test out I don't remember if that link is showing up in the record too um, I think it might not be because it doesn't have the zero there but you'll see it, you'll see it in the uh, in the record from the record side so when you go to merge any of these things are signs that you don't want to merge the record 
Um, it, because, as I mentioned, that you, while you can't add holdings to um, directly to the records, if you merged the records and you chose this one as the lead record, you would end up with holdings from the physical items attached to this record, which we don't want. It's, it, it's confusing to patrons. They would look something up and it would look like there's only an ebook in the catalog and they'd think, oh, you know, I don't have a Kindle or an iPad or what have you. I, now I can't look at this book, whereas in actuality, you might have it on the shelf in your library. So you don't want to mislead your patrons into thinking that um, something is available electronically only when, in fact, you have it in print. And um, additionally, as far as merging, if you if you merge it the other way, where you actually merge, chose the print version as the lead record, then we would lose the links to the OverDrive records um, in the catalog. Then there would no longer be access for this uh, particular ebook item or e audiobook item in the Evergreen Indiana catalog, which we also don't want. So, this is why it's so important not to merge these OverDrive records. So, if I've hit you overhead, over the head with that enough, Hopefully, um, you, you can see that it is pretty easy to recognize these records as long as you know the signs. There are many, many signs throughout the record on how to recognize these. So, um, there are uh, a, a few resources um, we, that I'm linking to here. Is There's the, um, the cataloging and um, it, Indiana Digital Consortium Policies and Procedures. Um, this is a link directly to uh, e, the um, OverDrive page for e Indiana Digital Consortium. Um, you saw that in the records there are the links to the other consortiums. Uh, if you're a member of one of those consortiums, I'm sure you've got that as a uh, link on your uh, library website, so I didn't include all of those. Um, the uh, this is the link to bib formats and standards, which I, as a, I routinely link to in this. Um, it's useful if you're trying to remember, wait, what was that uh, letter that I sh should be watching for in the form field? Uh, or, um, what, or if you want to know in more detail what all those codes in the 006 and 007 forms uh, fields that you see in these digital records, you can look, go here to see those. So. Any more questions about how this is going to work, about <laughs> why we spent so much time talking about this, about how, or about any other cataloging questions that you may have been encountering lately? Um, they generally do. Um, for the most part, they have unique ISBNs, and these records have the ebook ISBN in them, and it looks like we're stripping the print ISBNs when we import them. They're not providing the, them on the new one. Okay, the new, the new record, because when I was looking, when I was reviewing the records, I didn't really see any with print ISBNs, which is very good to see because that tends to make it more confusing as to what you're looking at when you do a, um, when you do an ISBN search for a print item and you turn up an ebook record, that can cause confusion as to where you're supposed to add your holdings. I mean, it looks like most of these don't have, um, the print in there, they have their own unique ebook ISBNs or e audio ISBNs, as the case may be. If you are wondering about adding the ebook or e audio records, those are going to be added by the State Library, so you won't need to do that. Um, when are the records going to be added? <laughs> <laughs> We are working on the patron resource page, and that's our holdup. And well, that and we wanted to get to the training and make sure everyone was on the same page. But we're targeting mid-November right now. I'd like to have it in this in place before we start worrying about all the new fun things that are coming up with the upgrade. But we do want to make sure that the resource page is available for our patrons so that they have an easier transition to accessing these materials. So mid-November into early December right now. Well, it's going to be a link that's going to appear in the record, and it will say something along the lines of, what is my consortium? And they will 
go to that will be a link out to a different page that will tell them that the members of this consortium are and of this consortium are and of this consortium are. So they'll just need to find their library and they'll know which one they're associated with. And no, um, you don't need to add subfield twos specifically because those uh, the subfield twos are a field that indicates where that information in that 650 came from. So it's usually um, going to be a, at the source of some kind. In uh, in the case of the 650, if it doesn't have a subfield two, it probably just it's it's just a straightforward. Um, um, Library of Congress subject heading, so it, it doesn't actually need the subfield 2. The subfield 2 means that it was overdrive self-supplied. And it may, in fact, be that the overdrive supplied heading is the same as the Library of Congress heading, and so that subfield 2 isn't actually necessary. But it's one of the things that makes it kind of easier to recognize the record. So we're just going to, we're going to leave those, but no, it's not necessary to add them if you don't see them. Um, in general, uh, if you if it has some of the markers for overdrive and not others, you probably don't need to add them. If it if say the record was not properly coded and it wasn't displaying as an ebook, that would be something that we'd need to correct. But for the most part, you're not right or typos. You could correct those. Uh, if it was some if there was something that was very misleading that made it about the record, then we would want to edit it. For the, but for the most part, we're going to sort of accept the records as they are. Um, and if you see a record and you think it, there's something up with it, you can absolutely uh, send a message to the listserv and say, hey, you know, is this something that we need to edit? And we'll take a look at it and, try, and, and make a decision if it's something that merits changing. But if it's an obvious thing, like it's not coded for, um, it's not coded as an ebook. And so it's, still, it's displaying with a print icon. That would be definitely one that you would want to change. Shelley mentions that you may see playaways coded as electronic resources, but they aren't. That's absolutely true. Um, playaways uh, should be coded with a, um, with a Q. A lot of times they're coded with an S, which is a sort of general. Um, all the ones that are coded as S that are overdrive records should really be coded as O. Um, so if you wanted to change that, that would be fine. Um, but it, it's not necessarily necessary. Um, but it's it's a more up to date uh, code and. Playaways should be coded as Q. If they are coded as S, you should change the code to Q because it makes it much more clear. Then it will have the um, playaway icon instead of the ebook icon. So that's definitely something to watch out for. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the uh, guidelines about the OverDrive records uh, applies to playaway records. You don't want to merge playaway records with audiobook records. You also don't want to merge playaway records with OverDrive records. So anytime you see something that looks like an electronic resource, stop, and you probably don't want to merge it. Um, we, the question is, do you still want the 245 subfield H to say electronic resource? And the answer to that is yes and no. Um, if it's an AACR2 record, then absolutely it should have the subfield H. If it's an RDA record, RDA records are not supposed to have a subfield H, so you don't add it. Um, it's got that um, 338 field, and that's what's going to indicate the, uh, the format of item. Um, and Monica says, you said that some records aren't as good as we might like, and should we enhance them if we have time? And Monica, sure, go ahead. You can. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, right. It, uh, Jocelyn saying it's a comfort letter level. Um, it, it really depends on how comfortable you are with the MARC record. and. Um, do not feel that you should be upgrading these if the mark record is uh, intimidating to you and you're not as comfortable with it, especially with the ebook records, since that's a new thing. It, if you don't feel comfortable, don't do it. Um, and you, we don't want uh, you to feel like you need to be editing it and then maybe you're not as familiar with what everything should be. But if you are familiar and comfortable and you see things that could use fine tuning, go for it. 
we're always all about uh, improving the quality of the database. I, I would caution, however, that uh, occasionally we do get notice that OverDrive releases updated improved records. And because those come in the same way that the regular records do, just as an edited version, you may occasionally find your hard work undone. So I would not put a lot of extra time and energy into the records unless you're okay with that possibility. And it may be something that we can look at in the future that some of the things we can sort of bat, uh, there may be some batch updates we can do when we merge, when we load the records so that they'll be better quality to start with. So that might be something we can take a look at. Uh, report it. <laughs> so the question was, what do we do if we discover a mismerged overdrive record? And so uh, report that. Um, that it, you see a, a record that has holdings. Um, you can file a help test ticket because um, if it's been recent enough, then they, uh, our helpful IT guys can probably unmerge it. Um, so a help test ticket would probably be the best route to take if you see an overdrive re record with holdings. Yeah. Um, that, that'll be the easiest way. They can just sort of unzip it for us. If it's been too long since it occurred, then um, we would have to uh, do the fixing. Um, but I mean, if it's a fairly recent thing, they can backtrack. But so they'll not let you know if they can uh, fix it or not. And if not, then we'll have to take over and import a new record and transfer the holdings and you guys all know the drill with the mismerges. There isn't really a policy on that. It might be something that the cataloging committee can take a look at. Um, sometimes multiple 520s are useful because they uh, provide different um, information about the books and different uh, keyword access. Um, if it's really long, it might be not as helpful as because Patrons aren't going to be as likely to read it, but um, there, we, it's not something that there's currently any policy on. So um, if it's something that you'd like to address, um, in, you, if you want to send um, me some example records and we can take a look at them and see if there's, if it's something that we should address, we'll certainly consider it. And as a general rule, you do not need to delete an 035 when you import a record. Um, if you're cloning a record where you're making a record that's a copy of it uh, for a slightly different item, then you absolutely want to delete the 035 because the 035 is a record ID number. And so if you're making a copy of a record that's for a different resource, then that 035 would be referring to a different record and so you don't want to have a duplicate 035 for a different resource but if you're just importing a, uh, a record then you usually do not need to or want to delete the 035. Um, in some cases you might encounter a, a record that came from a, a where you're you're importing it from one of the other library Z3950 sources, and maybe then the, they might have cloned the record and not deleted it at the 035 as they should have, where you might end up with an issue with a duplicate 035. Um, but as a general, and so then you might need to delete one from an existing record in order to import a new one. Um, but as a general rule, you don't want to delete 035s um, when you import a record. They often um, have OCLC numbers in them, and for l libraries that use OCLC, those are really useful to have in the record, so we'd generally rather that you not <laughs> delete them. Um, when they're from other sources, I, I don't know if there are any uh, other record sources where the 035 is quite as, um, quite as an important identifier as it is for OCLC records. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that that uses a different record provider than might. But generally speaking, you do not need to 
delete O three fives when you import the records. Um, only when you're cloning records do you need to delete the O three fives. Because if you're copying a record to create a record for a slightly different resource, it can be misleading and cause issues if you have an O three five, a duplicate O three five in both records. We used the O three five in the most recent deduplication, and we found that. I think we weren't really pleased with the results and we're not planning to do that in the future. So uh, the answer is not that great. <laughs> is how does it work with our deduplications? <laughs> um, but it's not something that will, since we decided we weren't thrilled with the results, um, we felt like it ended up with more mismerges than we would like to see. We probably won't be using that in the future, so it's not. Um, necessarily going to be a, an issue as far as deduplications go. As I recall, and my memory is rusty on this, we actually, um, that's covered in the um, cataloging procedure guide. The subfield B, if it's there, great. If it's not there, we you're not required to add it. If you want to add it, you can, um, but it's not required. Because the subfield B, I'm is the one where you've got the codes. Subfield A for the three three X fields should definitely be there. As Jocelyn was saying that A is the content type um, term, B is the content type code, and then subfield two is the um, source. So it should have at least A and two. Um, B is, uh, is optional um, in Evergreen, Indiana. Any record has to have at least A or B. Um, some, some systems and libraries prefer one or the other. We decided that terms were more readable, um, and so that's the one that we're requiring. But um, there's no reason that we can't have B in there as well, and you're certainly welcome to add that if you're so inclined. And um, yes, we're planning on actually putting that uh, up uh, on um, Google Documents sh uh, to sh share, so you'll have the most updated versions always available. And um, that we're going to be posting that um, as I, I, when as soon as I've got these uh, turned over, I, as soon as I've got the Cat One recertification thing turned over to Anna, I'm going to focus on that and. Uh, uh, go go through uh, a few of these before I turn them over to get posted up. But um, yes, there will be a new cataloging manual in the near future. When is the cataloging refresher course coming? And I'm so sorry that it has taken so long for this to get out to you. Um, it's very soon. <laughs> um, I'm I'm finishing up the final touches on quizzes and screenshots right now, and uh, I'm going to have those all to Anna by the end of the week. So very soon, it's going to be up, and um, I, to the delight of everyone, I'm sure, who just can't wait to take in a, a fun, <laughs> uh, an exciting cataloging refreshing course. We, uh, we will revise the date of when that's due. Um, it's not going to be year end since, it is, uh, since it's being released so much later than we originally planned. And the good news is that I'm going to seg immediately into working on it for next year, so we'll get the next year's one much sooner. Well, thank you everyone for attending the cataloging roundtable this morning. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, go out, tell your friends <laughs> that if, if they're not attending the cataloging roundtables, they should watch the recordings once those are posted. Um, it's useful information and uh, stuff we all need to know about what's coming up in Evergreen. And um, we appreciate you making the effort to stay informed about what's going on. <laughs>